Hello and welcome. This is Right Medicine and I'm Alex Housen. I'm here today with Jonathan Agnew, who is a freelance medical writer, and we're going to talk about how to get started as a freelance medical writer. Welcome, Jonathan. Hi, great to be here. Good to see you. And we're on the same, the same time zone, which I always appreciate. Yes. Um, so please share with listeners who you are and something about your current work. Sure. Uh, as you said, I'm a freelance medical writer. Uh, I've been doing that part-time since 2013. I became a full-time medical writer uh, a couple of years ago when, when COVID took off. Um, I also offer an online course on how medical writers can find clients and land contracts. Uh, prior to doing that as a medical writer, I was in a number of different areas of healthcare, including government, the private sector, academia, healthcare regulation. Uh, my academic background is in health policy. I have a PhD from UC Berkeley. Uh, I also did an MBA at the University of London in the UK, and I have a bachelor's degree in community health from Brown University. So you have been in the healthcare environment for quite a long time. I imagine you've seen a lot of changes in terms of uh, policy and uh, focus in the healthcare landscape. Oh, absolutely. It's been uh, huge. In terms of you know, just professions, the, the mix of people and professions that are doing work has, has changed dramatically. Mm. Uh, the, you know, when I first started my career, it was the beginnings of, of managed care in the U S. So that was obviously a huge shift and everything mm -hmm. has been changing since then. Um, now obviously the big, the big thing is, is what everyone sees is, is how much and how far healthcare can be pushed into a virtual space. Right. Yeah. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? Well, you know, there's, um, I think a lot of. A lot of people are trying to understand how they can expand access and reach by pairing providers with with patients uh, in a virtual environment. Just mm. like anyone with a desk job has gone virtual, is using online tools. You know, how far can that happen in, in medicine? Obviously, there's a limit. At some point, you have to see and touch a patient in, in real mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a lot of education and counseling that, that doesn't have to happen that way. And that opens up some really incredible possibilities for, for reaching people uh, and patients in a way that they, they couldn't be reached before. That, that's pretty exciting. Now, I think we're going to see the next shift is going to be, you know, layered on top of that is, is AI, right? Mm -hmm. That's going to be, you know, AI is, is, is uh, everywhere. It, it's going everywhere. It hit the mass market now. Um, and we'll, we'll probably see that. In terms of you know, pharma, biotech, manufacturing, medical devices. Uh, it's just, it seems like the sky is the limit for, for different kinds of innovations, different populations being reached. Uh, it is, it's, it's dynamic and it's moving fast. And it's, it's a fantastic time to be a medical writer because you get to be part of all of this. And uh, there is, there's definitely, there's a lot more work out there than there are medical writers. Oh, that's, that's always reassuring to hear, right? Because I think that one of the one of the challenges that a lot of people who are kind of coming into medical writing um, have is, you know, not starting with an abundance mindset. You know, I think what you're describing is an abundance mindset Absolutely. And, and a perception that, yeah, there's enough work out there for everybody, um, but you need the kind of tools and techniques to to find it. And I think when you first come into the field, there is definitely a um, an anxiety and a concern that, you know, how am I going to be able to make this shift? Uh, how am I going to be able to, you know, make, um, make this work for me and find clients and get sustainable work? And we'll, we'll definitely come to that because I know that you have something of expertise in, in shepherding people through that process yes. uh, of, of finding work. But I am, uh, it, you know, it's interesting that you kind of landed on the virtual, the way that the virtual landscape is um, emerging and being enhanced within um, healthcare. Obviously, in the in the US, you know, the relaxation of telehealth regulations by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid and Medi Med Medicaid and Medicare Services um, did a lot to really um, expand uh, virtual virtual healthcare in the, in the U S. Um, and one of the other areas where we've seen that expansion is of course, 
in online education and online continuing medical education in particular. And I know that that's an area that you work in. So could you just say a little bit about how you landed in that in that oh, sort of area? Sure. Yeah. I mean, like like so many, uh, it was by chance. <laughs> With, I was uh, hired by a client. It was a major health professional education company to do some work for them on a small writing project and do some data analysis. Uh, and then they were hitting crunch time with some submissions and said, you know, can you step in and just help us with a couple things? I said, mm -hmm. I said, sure. And uh, they assigned me a needs assessment. So uh, that was my first uh, sort of toe in the water there. And from that point, it just it just took off. They came back with more work. I found others who had you know, similar needs and, and did work with them and uh, was pleasantly surprised again by just just how much work, good work. Regular work, well-paying work was was available there. Now, I want to pick up on that phrase, I find others with similar needs. So that's the point where a lot of new to the field writers get stuck. You know, how to kind of find the others who have a similar writing need. So, it, you know, it's challenging to start out as a freelance medical writer. Um, you know, I know that we've talked about you know, a whole bunch of considerations that, um, you know, new to the field writers have to think about, such as, you know, the business part of things, whether they're going to niche down, uh, whether they're going to have more of a sort of generalist approach. What what kind of advice did you find most helpful at the beginning of your freelance career? Because it sounds as though, you know, you've you've spent a considerable amount of time in education and um in the public sector. And so bringing, you know, that's a very unique kind of experience to, to bring to um, the start of a business venture. So can you talk a little bit about how you made that transition and some of the advice that you found most helpful? Uh, it, it was the thing, what, what you said right at the beginning, which is mindset, that, that is far and away the most helpful helpful thing. Um, it's more important than the details of your corporate structure, the details of setting mm. up a practice, of the nuts and bolts of completing a project, how to, how to write or, or craft certain deliverables. Not that those things aren't important, but it's the mindset that is going to set you apart from your peers. And, and it's what's going to allow you to succeed and work to the fullest of your own, your own potential. Mm. Uh, there were, there's a few things within that under that umbrella of mindset that that probably have served me best. First would be uh, a willingness to take a risk, mm -hmm. to take on a project that may be outside what you're accustomed to. It, you know, too often, for those of us with backgrounds and advanced degrees in, in science or statistics or, or healthcare or clinical uh, career, you know, we're, we're accustomed and trained to achieve perfection. And you know, in, in freelance consulting, clients are looking for excellence and value. They're not necessarily looking for perfection. They need something mm -hmm. done by a certain amount of time within a certain budget. And if you can deliver a quality deliverable on time, then then you've, you've made it. You've, you've, you've done a good business, right? Uh, along with that, mindset is also learning to value, value yourself fairly. Um, hmm. I've, I've seen freelancers work for free to, to get exposure or build up the portfolio. And that always ends up, that's just a missed opportunity because if someone's willing to work for you seriously, they're willing to, to pay you for it. Mm -hmm. Um, I've seen freelancers when they, when they charge for work really tend to undervalue their hourly or their project rate. Uh, I've, I've been guilty of this too, and I've, I've created for myself a 15% rule. So I sit down, I write down, okay, what is the, the price I could say with a straight face that I think is most fair for this project? Uh, and I write that number down. Really, you know, what you know, pushing, but what would sound reasonable that I I'm not, don't think would scare them off? I write that mm -hmm. number down and then um, and then I add 15% on top of that. And that's what I propose. And and it, it works. It's never, it's never failed me. I mean, it's a bit of a mental trick. You know, at this point now, I... I I don't have to do that so much, right? I, I kind of intuitively know when I get something, what I think it's, it, you know, the market will bear. But at the beginning, I had to just, you know, take that. And I was, you know, my hand would be shaking sometimes before I'd hit click and send <laughs> on the proposal. But, um, 
you know, the fear that they're going to reject me because it's too high has never happened. They, if they want you, they'll come back with a different, with a counter or something, but, but usually they just say yes. Um, what's the other, oh, the other mindset thing would be just remembering to have fun. You know, that you, if you left your, uh, a corporate job or as an employee to go work as a freelancer, you have to remind yourself that, that you didn't do that only to go work for a more difficult boss. You know, the person staring at the mirror in the morning, right? Uh, that you, um, you've, you've taken on the risk of running your own business. You've taken on that yeah. responsibility and you have to remember to enjoy the rewards of that, right? You know, why can't your freelance practice have a corporate policy that employees get a nice lunch out every Friday? You know, why can't your corporate policy be that um, on Wednesdays we work from our favorite cafe? You know, there's, there's, no, there's nothing stopping you. The only thing that's stopping you is your mindset, right? Um, and there's just so much room to have have fun and really enjoy this work that that mm-hmm. you've you know been bold enough to take the risk to take that first step out. Um, it it is fun and it can be fun and it it's a tragedy if the reason you're not having fun is because you're stopping that yourself, right? So just go out and have fun. I really like that emphasis on boldness and fun. I'm really listening to the words that you're that you're using um, in in terms of describing that transition from whatever it was that you were doing before into freelance medical writing, uh, whether it's uh, specializing in continuing medical education or 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 some other. The field is is so is so wide, and I I. I'm intrigued by the 15% rule. You know, uh, I've heard others talk about the 20% rule. Even but, better. That's, 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 yeah, even, say, yeah, that's, even better. <laughs> even better. I think 20% is is interesting, especially if you have begun to develop an awareness of yourself that you do undercharge. Um, and you talked about that feeling and, and knowing intuitively, uh, you know, what a, a kind of decent rate. But that that intu- that intuition is something that is built up over repetition and yes. you know practice over over time i think it's important to uh to acknowledge that one of the things that um that i you know i find interesting in the way that you're talking about you know building a business is is a kind of easy and confident way of thinking about what you are doing as a business and I know that you said that mindset is really important as you're making that transition. But I think one of the things that is really challenging for a lot of people, especially if they're coming out of academia or coming out of clinical practice, um, or even you know coming from a research um, background, you know, at the at, at the bench, is to see what we're doing as a business. And I know from my own experience that when I made the mindset shift from being a freelance writer to running a freelance writing business, then things really shifted for me in terms of how I saw the work that I was doing and um, the, the, you know, the kind of work that I wanted to do. So I'm curious how, you know, is that something that you see when you are coaching other writers and, um, what is some advice that you would give to writers who really struggle with the idea of uh, seeing what they're doing as running a business? That you really hit on the crux of it there, Alex. I mean that that is what will will differentiate in general the people who will um, thrive, you know, financially through through this, and and those who may feel like they're never quite quite getting there. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's re- recognizing that, that it's, it's a business. Um, I go back to my first thing. I'll repeat myself, have fun with it. It, mm-hmm. it. it is fun to be able to actually make, make money doing something that you enjoy. I mean, there, there mm-hmm. are a few greater pleasures in, in life than, than that. Right. Uh, and realize that yeah, right. you, you should be enjoying that, you know, what you're, you're actually doing and, and to get paid for that is, is it's, it's, it's a, you know, a double win. I think for those who, to make the shift into d- seeing this as a business, um, and most of us don't have business background or, or business training, right. is, is to begin by keeping in mind a very simple definition of quality. I think that's where it comes in. And, and you have to think of quality, define it as simply something the client is willing to pay for, period. 
if if you have something and someone's willing to pay for it, then by definition, that is that's what you're going to say is is a quality product. Mm-hmm. Um, your your best metric of business success as a freelancer is that you get paid, mm-hmm. uh, and in that sense, business success is not related to your your subjective personal idea of whether you did a good or a bad job on a project. Mm-hmm. That may be your personal definition of success or your personal fulfillment that you can get from these things. But in terms of just business, um, I've had projects where I thought I did a, you know, okay job and the client was over the moon with it. You know, you just, you'll, you'll see more that, that happens more often than, than not actually I'll do something and think, you know, I, I was really under the gun or I want to make sure I got this out on time for them. Um, you know, I, I have my own quality measures in place while I'm working mm-hmm. for, for proofing and editing to make sure, you know, that nothing, nothing slips out. Um, but you know, most of us all, there's always something more that could be done on a project. At some point you have to draw the line and say, the project is done and this will meet the client's expectations. Uh, and so, so it's really what the client thinks and if they like it, they will pay you. And that's the definition of success. Better yet, uh, they come back for repeat business. Then you've absolutely right. succeeded. And if you, if you have that, um, I learned to get over the need to, have feedback from clients that if they're coming back to me regularly for business, then I'm doing a fine job. They, they, they're, they otherwise wouldn't be coming back. And just keeping that really clear and simple, my definition of quality is that I'm getting paid for what I do. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it clarifies it enormously. And um, yeah, no, thanks. Uh, that's a really uh, great definition. I like that um, definition of, of quality. You mentioned client expectations. Um, I think this is another area where it's it can be pretty challenging, especially people who are new to the field, to identify what client expectations are for given projects. Do you have, um, and I think this feeds into another question I want to ask about um, simplicity, because that seems to be where you're going with your your processes and, and protocols. So, so two questions here. What kind of processes and protocols do you have in place to streamline your um, your your business and how you you run your business? And second, how do you or how have you approached the question of how to identify what client expectations are? Oh, well, so for for streamlining, I mean, I would encourage anyone, and this is just from my own previous professional experience, where. Um, we had to implement in our in our company a quality management system, and that was some of the best learning I've I've ever had. Uh, and what what came from that was just knowing what your own explicitly defining your own process and procedures. Mm-hmm. And that works for you know Toyota as big as it is, and it works mm-hmm. for a solo freelancer too. So whenever I see a pattern is emerging in my work, I I document it and create a checklist. Right. And that um, has been probably, it, it relieves a lot of stress because it's, if I run something through a checklist before, you know, I've, I have, for example, I have a, a proofing checklist that I go through before it goes out. I mm-hmm. literally pull up the file and go through mm-hmm. box by box and make sure it's all checked off. And that that saves me from the 3 a.m. panic. You know, I, I, do, I don't wake up anymore wondering, you know, did I get this? No, I did it. It went through the checklist. Mm-hmm. It, it's been, you know, the seven steps I have to proofing. They're all completed and done and I feel confident that it's going out. But th- that's that's one thing. If you see a pattern, mm-hmm. write it down, make yourself a right. checklist uh, and and treat yourself like like a business. Like if you're working mm-hmm. at a big company, you would be surprised if that was happening. Well, you are working at a company. It just happens to yeah. be you, but all the more reason that you should you know be really systemic, systematic mm-hmm. in your approach. Mm-hmm. Um, your second question was about client expectations. And I think I have found um, what I what I what I do at the beginning of a project. Once I'm talking to the person I need to talk to, and that means the the economic buyer, so the person who has mm-hmm. the ability to actually write the check and, and set mm-hmm. the budget and say yes, mm-hmm. uh, is is I and we've agreed on everything we've talked to. Is I send it back to them as a conceptual agreement, mm-hmm. no more than a couple pages. But here's what I'm here's what I'm doing. Here's what I'm delivering. Here's how this is going to improve your condition. Uh, here's the timeline, here's the fee. And with that document, um, again, and I know this sounds a little counterintuitive, if I hear nothing, I assume everything is fine. Right. And I, and I go ahead with that. Uh, and then that, that, that seems to be the best way to, to set expectation. 
Um, the client often, you know, the best clients are the ones who really do know what they want, in which case it's easy. That conceptual agreement, yeah. if they've been clear, you write that down, you send it back and then you begin the work. Uh, some clients may just may not know what they want until they see what you deliver and realize, oh, that isn't really what I want, which is which is mm-hmm. fine. But you just have to make sure that you build that into the business with them, right? That um, how many versions of this are we going to be doing back and forth, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, if you're doing, um, you know, uh, say you're doing a, a, a grant proposal and there's a team involved, um, is every member on the team going to be giving you feedback? Are they going to do it twice? How many times is that really going to happen? Yeah. So, um, you know, and you can be the one to clarify that, right? This deep assessment will be this length. Uh, version one will be delivered on this date. We'll give a week for the team members to get their feedback to me. Version two will be on that date and we'll consider it done at that point. Mm-hmm. Or maybe more if you want, but mm-hmm. you build it in. It's it's instructive, actually. You know, one of one of my kind of process questions for working with new clients is to, is actually to ask them to describe what their process is oh. for, you know, reviewing and, um, uh, you know, developing, you know, whatever project that we're, that we're working on. And I think there's a couple of things there. One is that, you know, clients who, who have already thought about this and they have a process and are able, able to articulate that process to me on a, on a startup call. Um, or a getting to know you call um, are generally clients that you know ha- have turned out to be long long term because he, they are already accustomed to you know working with ease right. with um, with freelance writers. But the prospective clients who who struggle with that question um, are are often the ones that that really struggle to work collaboratively with writers. Um, because they don't, and I think you said this, they don't really see them as part of the team. They're, they're an external vendor. They are a kind of transactional piece rather than somebody yes. who's kind of contributing collaboratively to, yeah. to the process. And I think that's something, that's something that, you know, develops with time and experience is getting that sense of who's going to be good to work with. Um, and who are you going to be able to have those conversations with about uh, about process um, and about how you approach your work? Because that'll also feed them to the quality question or the quality issue. Um, you know, how smooth and easy is the process of working with with clients? I mean, I guess that would be one of my uh, one of the things I'd want to add to the the, the quality definition. So. Um, what have you found most surprising about running a freelance medical writing business? Um, two, two things, I would say. Uh, first, about how quickly I, I became accustomed to being my own boss, <laughs> enjoying the freedom of working for myself. Yeah. It, it uh, greatly outweighs uh, what I thought of as you know, job security and predictability when I was an employee. Uh-huh. Um, it's uh, It's been... I, I do work nights and weekends. My my schedule mm-hmm. can be all over the place. But I also take extended lunch with my wife. I drop my kids off at school. Uh, I've worked from my laptop in, in lots of fun places. Mm-hmm. Uh, things I could never have done when I was an employee. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second mm-hmm. thing, is, and I would say this is unique to, to medical writing or an advantage of it, is, is how enormous the opportunities for work there are. You know, for for a lot of people who think about any kind of freelance work, uh, there's a, there's a struggle to to market to, to land good contracts, and um, you know I've done other kinds of business and management consulting before, and freelance medical writing was unique in how relatively little effort I had to put into marketing to find you know good clients and and pretty pretty steady work. And why do you think that is? It's supply and demand. There, there's just uh, there, there's so much, so much innovation, so many different products coming on the market um, in manufacturing, biotech, pharmaceutical, medical mm-hmm. device, mm-hmm. Uh, and there's there's so much um, medical education and professional education that needs to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you think about you know every licensed provider out there has some requirement for continuing education, and yeah. someone has to draft. All of it, all of it. Yeah. I mean, every every word you see 
that's been written has been typed by someone. And it doesn't take you long to think, my goodness, that, that's a lot of typing that has to happen. And, and it requires skill. And it requires people who uh, you know, can put in some, some, some thought and, and bring to some knowledge and training to, before that, that can happen. And there's just, there's, there's so much demand for that. And there just aren't many, aren't many people. Most, you know, most medical writers don't go into their, you know, educational program planning on ending up as a medical writer. Most of us of were, were something else before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, so there aren't really, you know, even the programs that do exist to certify medical writers uh, are dependent on, on you having gotten a degree in something else in some other thing. It's never like just a first degree, right? So um, that means that you know, if you need people with certain kinds of expertise to be a medical writer, those people generally aren't medical writers. They're doing whatever that expertise is. <laughs> they're seeing patients or they're doing research or, or they're working in, in, in some other agency. So, they're, you know, so to find someone who has that kind of experience and, and interest, you know, is, there's, there aren't many. And, and that means it's great for those who want to be in the field. Right. And so for those who are new to the field, you know, where should they start in thinking about getting their business off the ground? Uh, I do a couple things in parallel, actually. First, I would find a mentor. I would mm -hmm. connect with someone who's done this before and learn from their experience. Um, but myself, I've you know been able to answer questions for new medical writers really quickly that I know mm -hmm. took me <laughs> a lot longer when I started. And it's right. nice Same. to be able to just advise <laughs> someone and say, you know, don't go down that, you know, go down yeah. this road or. Or, or try it this way, or, or just even I can, you know, to give them the confidence that, look, you, you know, what you've shown me here is, is, is plenty to go on and, and land a good contract. So, you know, go for it. Um, the second thing would be uh, in parallel with that. Also, don't wait, just start, start working. Go to an online platform and begin making bids. There's very little downside to doing so. And you're going to learn yourself in the, in, in the process of getting that done, you know, what, what's possible and what's out there. Just, just so, do it. What, so when you say go to an online platform and start making bids, what are you talking about there? So, uh, for example, Upwork would be a great example. Mm -hmm. uh, Upwork is a you know, freelance marketplace. Mm -hmm. uh, you can you know, create your own profile, put up your portfolio materials, you know, uh, a photo of yourself, right? A description mm -hmm. of what you want to do. Um, and you can start looking for, for, for projects. The nice thing is that um, you know, a platform like, like Upwork uh, you you don't have to guess what the market is 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 needing. It's right mm -hmm. there. People have mm -hmm. put a bid up, put a, put a project up because they need something done, right? And you just need to find something that that aligns well with you. Uh, and that's you know one of my one of my great joys is showing people how to actually you know write that bid so that they're going to get the uh, response um, and 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 land land a contract. It's so interesting hearing you talk about Upwork, and I know that there are, that there are other sites. As well, and I think I think Upwork used to be either Guru dot com or, or Elance. I can't remember yeah, which yeah. now, but because a lot of medical writers, particularly um, those with long with longevity and who are members of the American Medical Writers Association, often counsel new writers away from uh, job boards and sites like Upwork. Upwork. What What do you find that um, is especially attractive what kind of posts um could new to the field writers anticipate seeing on on a site like upwork well, I, I i i can understand why people might might guide someone away from from upwork you do have to approach it with with a certain you know attitude and, and an abundant mindset you, you for example you you don't want to go in bidding on a project where there are a hundred other people and the right. you know it, it there's a very low return you, you'll just end up getting quite, quite discouraged. So you have to be, mm -hmm. you know, selective in, in going mm -hmm. at it. For those who are in the U.S. or Americans, you know, there, there's a button on Upwork, on Upwork for, you know, U.S. only, right? Where there are people right. who post oh, a project and are just searching for U.S.-based clients, right? So already that that puts you into the category where you, you wipe out a lot of the competition that, that that's mm -hmm. from abroad. Uh, mm -hmm. And then they're those clients are looking for quality work that they are going to be pay, expecting to pay a certain amount for. So that's an example of how you would approach mm -hmm. it. There's, there's other things you would want to do. Um, but my point is this, is too often 
new medical writers are hesitant to start out again because of the whole I I have to wait till I'm perfect at, perfect at this or I have to get everything yeah. set up perfectly. My advice is just go out and start doing it. Just yeah. just do it uh, because you know you can you can move ahead. But but if I were advising a new medical writer, that might not be the very first place I would say to go. I would say yeah. um, I would recommend um, you know I mean, if you were to ask me you know what advice I would offer writers about how to find clients. Um, and I, I have a whole section on my own medical writing course just on mm -hmm. finding mm -hmm. clients. Mm -hmm. um, I do that well, you know, as a side. I mean, there are great resources out there, including yours, including your course, which I've taken on um, CME writing and other types of medical writing. Uh, because you know, if you master that, that technical side of it um, and you marry that with a solid approach to finding clients, you, you are destined for a thriving medical writing career. Right. Quite simply, it starts with mindset of, of knowing, not just believing, but knowing that you have something very valuable to offer. And for those medical writers getting started, um, you know, I would say, you know, get on the platforms and put up, put up a profile at a minimum, it's a passive way to find a client. I've had mm -hmm. clients, I've had mm -hmm. people just find me and approach me, which is, which is mm -hmm. awesome. Um, but I recommend beginning with your own network of colleagues and contacts. Just, you sit down, uh, make a list of 10 to 20 people whom you know by name and who might have medical writing or contract work for you. Mm -hmm. if, if you've worked for any time in a career, you can easily generate a list of 10 names. It's not that hard. Right. Um, and then you take a few hours one morning and you go through that list and your goal is to get... I tell people who are starting, your goal with that list is to get one contract, right. one contract. Um, so if you have a list of 10 to 20, that means 90 to 95% of people can reject you <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you'll still meet your goal, right? Of getting mm -hmm. that one contract, right. you know, for each person on that list, you send an email and you follow up with a phone call. And if they don't have work, ask them for the names of three contracts that, that might have uh, some work for you and you add those names to the bottom of the list and you just keep working through it. Um, every time I've seen you know, sort of a, a gap coming up in my pipeline, I've gone back to my list. I make the list. I start doing it. I've not once has that technique ever failed me. Right. You know, yeah. And it's, um, and, and the reason, and what does fail the new medical writer is sort of the one shot pray and hope and repeat. Right. Where you, 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 you say, Oh, I really, I hopefully so and so can offer me something. You call them up. You don't hear back. You call them again. You don't hear back. You send an email. You finally get touched. They say no and you're devastated. And meanwhile, you've spent three days waiting for that, you know, magic yeah. yes to come. That, that's a recipe for, you know, emotional disaster and, and bad business. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you, if you think, no, no, my goal is to get one contract is to have a, a one out of 10 or a one out of 20 success rate. Your mentality, just like you said at the beginning, you've shifted. Now I'm doing a business, mm -hmm. right? I'm not just a freelance medical writer offering a product. I'm running a business mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and I have a metric that I'm trying to achieve. And, um, you know, how long does it take to make 10 phone calls and send out 10 emails? It's not that long, right? It's it, not that long, but there is a mindset, uh, you know, attached to that as well. And I think, and you mentioned the word, the word passive. And I think one of the things that I see among new writers is that they, they often feel more comfortable in that passive role of people finding work for them. And so then get stuck in, you know, some kind of agency role or, or some other kind of arrangement where they're, they're subcontracting to yes. somebody else. And that can have advantages. And that is also a good way to get your foot in the door, but it can also feed that anxiety and fear about, I don't want to talk to people about the services that I offer. I, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit, you know, anxious and scared to do that what if they think I'm a pest and mm -hmm. you know all those kinds of things and that definitely does get in the way for for a lot of um, people and actually you know I used job boards when I first started writing you know way back in uh, you know 2006 or so or so because I I had I'd written books and I'd written academic articles but I didn't have um uh y you know kind of business or commercial related types of writing in my portfolio. So it was actually a really good way to A, learn to do different types of writing and B, learn to do them quickly yeah. and C, negotiate. Yeah. Um, I think there's probably a lot less negotiation now on those kinds of sites than perhaps there were, you know, 15 or so years ago. Um, 
So, you know, just to kind of wrap up, we've talked about um, the the kinds of things that you recommend to new to the field writers in terms of building up their business and finding new clients. And I know that you talk about these things in much more depth in, in your own course. Are there any other things that we haven't really touched on that you think are important for new to the field medical writers to be thinking about as they um, begin to make that transition into what is essentially a new identity and a new way of being? Well, wow, that's a great, it's a good question. I think um, if I were to add a like, I mean, other, other nuggets that kind of helped me, one would be to, to avoid all or nothing thinking. We tend to be mm. really dramatic mm-hmm. when we're thinking. So um, there's nothing wrong with, um, you know, first of all, for starting a medical writing career, um, there's nothing wrong with keeping the job you have now, if that's what you want to do and do medical writing, you know, on the side. Um, you know, when I for did sure. this as a hobby, uh, as a you know, freelance on the side, um, I had a very small goal. I said, let me see if I can bring home, if I can bill. You know, the first goal I had when I really sort of got pretty serious about the medical writing, if I could make this a real thing, but didn't want to leave my job, was um, can I um, can I bring home ten bill ten percent of my take home income mm. in a month, mm-hmm. just you know, which is which is was a modest amount, uh, something that I could have done you know nights and weekends, not too difficult, um, and I achieved that goal. And then you say, well, let's see if we could push it to 20, right? Well, pretty soon you're, you're at a pretty high percentage. And at that point you can say, you know, this looks like it's actually a viable, a viable thing, mm-hmm. right? And you can decide mm-hmm. whether you want to, you, know, uh, you know, pull the cord or press the button or, you know, you know, move over and, and mm-hmm. do it, do it full time or not. Mm-hmm. But, but the point is, is that uh, you don't have to think all or nothing. It's not, I'm only working right. as an employee and never going to do medical writing because I can't get out of my job or I'm mm-hmm. only going to be working as a freelancer. Oh God, that's a lot of risk, and I'm scared to do it. Right? Why, mm-hmm. we'll take the best of both worlds, right? Mm-hmm. Even when you're working now as a freelancer, you still got to watch out for the trap of all or nothing thinking. Yes, um, yeah, yeah. It's you know, if a client comes with a project that is, um, you know, sometimes you'll you'll be asked to do a really big project, and maybe you can't take all that on. You think, oh, I'll have to say no to this. Well, no, you don't. Maybe you could say yes to part of it. And say, mm-hmm. look, I really want to be part of this. Um, I think I can offer this. You know, can we do that? Um, same thing with, um, you know, when you're, um, with the mix of work that you have, as you said, why not have a mix of your, you know, 20% of your work coming from job boards and 80% from a few <laughs> long-term clients, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it keeps you fresh. It keeps yeah. a mix of new things kind of coming in. It keeps you on the pulse of this, that less reliant on, you know, just those handful of clients. So, so you always, you know, you don't feel like you are, are stuck with them either, right? Uh, so yeah, getting out of all or none thinking is is another. It, it, it goes back to mindset. <laughs> That's what we said mm-hmm. at the beginning. It's probably one of the best best pieces of advice. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I I really appreciate that, and I think that one of the things that fits into that all or nothing nothing thinking is the idea of niche. I am a big believer in in thinking about establishing a niche, but establishing a niche or a niche, as they say in in the in the US, establishing a niche doesn't. It's not, that's not an all or nothing thing. You can have a very um, identifiable niche, but have different revenue streams within that niche. Exactly. So that you're, yeah, so that you're making sure that you're, you know, have sufficient diversification to um, a- accommodate a revenue stream that suddenly dries up. You know, and and that, still got other things. I think that's a great point. And it, it speaks again to the, the all or nothing thinking that uh, we tend to saddle ourselves with, especially for, for those with a clinical or a very specific scientific background, um, mm. again, where you're expected to pursue perfection and, and your success in those fields depends on your hyper-specialization uh, and then an unwillingness or feeling like you have an inability to go yeah. outside that. Um, you know, there are, I've, I've never found it fruitful to be a medical writer who says all I do is oncology, right? There, I mean, th- there are some things that require that, that expertise, but as a, as a business, uh, mm-hmm. Why limit yourself to a, a single area? And often in, in most medical writing, um, as you develop your, your expertise and a sense of what clients need and the kind of mm-hmm. you know, messaging and the, the methodologies you're going to use, those are transferable across any medical yeah. specialty or, or subspecialty. So I, I think you, you generalize and, and thrive. And then let the market tell you if specialization in a particular area is going to be worth it, it'll be very clear, right? If you start seeing that yeah. contracts are coming from a particular area, 
or there's a client that needs something, you will, your, your practice will evolve organically in that direction anyway. Right. But I wouldn't start out by limiting yourself and saying, I'm only going to be doing this because that's what I'm comfortable with. You got to break that and just say, I'm a, I'm a medical writer um, and, and go for it. Good advice. How can listeners find you? Oh, the best way is my email. It's uh, my first name, Jonathan, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N at agnewmedical.com or just go to my website, agnewmedical.com. And we'll make sure that that's in the show notes as well as any links to uh, the course offerings that you have coming up so that people can get in touch with you about that. Jonathan Agni, thank you so much for sharing your insights and wisdom with listeners of Right Medicine. Thank you so much, Alex. It's been a pleasure. Uh